Welcome, everyone. Thanks for turning up. Uh, this talk was actually only added to the program, I think, on Sunday after I uh, bumped into Gita, and she asked me to do this one, so appreciate everyone turning up. Um, so those of you who don't know me before, um, I'll introduce myself a bit more in a second, but usually I do quite technical talks. This one is going to be more around the kind of strategy and leadership stuff. So if any of you saw me on Sunday, I was talking about Specto, who I work for there. But this is based on a on a number of case studies I've done, or a number of um, companies I've worked with as a consultant over the last, say, oh, five years or so now. I've been working on what we call microservices. I was a CTO at one company where we adopted microservices. I then became a consultant for Open Credo, um, and then I ended up doing work with Spectre as well. So I've been sort of permanent and contract, worked on many different microservice projects. And I, what I'm going to try and sort of take, uh, try and convey today, and I'd like you to kind of take away, is that often with microservices, um, the architecture seems super interesting, or the tech seems super interesting, but often lots of problems follow from trying to adopt those things. And more often than not, I find it's actually a people problem. Now, Eberhard Wolf, anyone who knows Eberhard, he tweeted the other day that the second law of consulting is it's always a people problem. Yeah, it doesn't matter what, you know, what you're doing. And I definitely have found this. As much as I like to be a techie, I, I identify as a Java developer primarily, um, a lot of stuff I do these days with consulting is actually dealing with people issues. And, and I'm going to try and share some stories of projects I've worked on, um, mistakes I've made, successes I've had, and so forth. Uh, the ideal goal would be if you were to take away some things that you could work with, you know, with your company, uh, with clients you work with, and not make the same mistakes as I've made. Yeah? We're all going to make mistakes. This is why we do technology. We love learning and stuff. But if I can short-circuit some of the mistakes, that would be a win for me uh, for today. So many of the problems are people problems, but this is good news, because a lot of our business friends have been working with this stuff for a longer time than we have. Uh, Martin opened the conference on Sunday. Software development is a relatively new field. Yeah, 68 kind of came into being. Business has been going on for much, much longer. So I think we can borrow stuff from the business world and kind of bring it into our, wor our work as technologists. And whoever or however you identify, you know, team lead, architect, QA, operator, take your pick. I think there's things we can learn by looking at our business friends. Very quickly, this is me, at Daniel Bryant on the Twitters. Love getting involved on the Twitters. Hashtag go to CPH here as well. I work primarily as a consultant. I'm also doing a CTO role at Specto as, as well, which I won't talk about loads today. But if you're looking for microservice training or products around um, microservice testing, we're doing that kind of stuff. Uh, I primarily do Java stuff, a bit of ops as well, a lot of architecture these days, really into continuous delivery. I really see this as a, as a genuine enabler in projects, regardless of technology or, or regardless of architecture. Continuous delivery is, is really key. And I've actually I've written a, a book that's available free on the left there, the one with containerizing continuous delivery in Java. And for my sins, I'm working on a full book that will be out next year and that kind of tries to capture more the technical lessons that I'm going to be sharing with you today, sort of the, the technical side of these lessons. So let's jump straight in. It's important to note that any technology goes through a series of, of sort of adoption phases, and they call this the diffusion of innovation. Now, are people familiar with diffusion of innovation at all? So I'll see a few nods. But no, yeah. So basically what it says is, is typically pioneers, you know, innovators that work on the technology. Then sort of early adopters pick it up, and then there's this moment where things cross the chasm. Now, a whole lot of technology never makes that jump. It never moves into the early majority, the late majority. That's the kind of mainstream, yeah? With microservices, you could say Netflix were pretty much the innovators. Adrian, we saw earlier today, they were pretty innovative. Early adopters, kind of companies I've worked with. And now I think microservices are very much here. They've crossed the chasm. They're pretty much accepted as a, as a pattern, but it's, it's sort of... It's interesting to note the journey we're going on as kind of the industry looks and sort of picks up the thing, uh, picks up the actual concepts around the thing, which is microservices in this case. One of the challenges we've got is we're taking technical cues from people in the innovator and early adopter stage, like Netflix and so forth, and they're not always suitable, those things, for where we are at now. And we're actually seeing vendors who are kind of in the late majority trying to pull people in with microservice-friendly tools. So there's this constant pull and push from both sides. Yeah, we are firmly in, I think, the early adopter space, but our problems are different than when you're in the kind of innovator space, where you're making stuff up as you go along, compared to the late majority. 
And if anyone was in Adrian's keynote, Adrian talks about Simon Wardley stuff, which I like a lot. And it's basically pioneers, settlers, where we are now, and town planners come later. Yeah? So we are very much settlers. Most of us working on microservices now are settlers. But that means there's too much information, too, mu too many products. And this makes our job as technical leaders, and I'm assuming it doesn't matter if you've got leader in your job title, but the fact you're at a conference is you, you want to learn more. You're leading to some degree. Yeah? So I, you know, I, I think all of us are technical leaders. We have to bear where we are in this curve in mind. Key things I'd like to uh, sort of share today around this, and you know, case studies and stuff, is th the three key things I found super beneficial. One was create and share the strategy and the tactics we're implementing. Two was optimize for feedback, yeah? And three was define responsibilities, particularly around who's doing what, and particularly around the platform, because microservices push a lot of complexity into the platform, into the communication. We're taking complexity that was, you know, it's, it's needed complexity, but it used to be in our monolith, or SOA, or whatever, and now that, that complexity doesn't disappear, it gets pushed typically into the platform, into the orchestration, into the coordination, these kind of things. So thinking about responsibilities of, you know, I'm a developer, am I responsible for that? Your QA, where's your responsibility? These things are really important. There was a great talk on Sunday that talked about situational awareness, and I'm a big fan of this kind of strategy is really important. You know, even if we identify purely as technologists, strategy is really important. You've got to ask yourself, you know, if you're getting excited about microservices, Docker, whatever, is it really a good fit for our organization? Yeah? Are microservices good? Um, I've seen a couple of anti-patterns on projects I've worked on where middle management have kind of latched on to this buzzword, yeah, microservices, and their managers have asked them, you know, are you now doing microservices? And if you say, like, if they say no, there's going to be problems. So they kind of, they, they co-opt things. They, you know, they say, oh, just chuck it in Docker. That'll be a microservice. You know, put an API on it. That'll be, you know, a microservice. And it's what we, we say in the UK, it's lipstick on the pig. Yeah. Fundamentally, it kind of you know it looks it may look a little better, but it's still not great behind the scenes. Yeah. From an architectural practice, I see a lot of people that don't really understand microservices are not just smaller services. Yeah. You know, building around business functionality is critical with microservices. If you haven't looked at domain-driven design, totally recommend checking that out. I think it's it's really a, a sort of key principle of building self-contained systems, you know, systems that are services that are based around your domain model, bounded contexts, as, as they're often referred to in the domain-driven design world. Bear in mind this whole platform thing. You, you really don't want to create mini monoliths, and we'll explore this a bit more in a minute, but bear in mind things like the 12 factors. Heroku created this guideline for deploying services onto PaaS called the 12 factors. There's a whole website dedicated to it, a very interesting gent, uh, based in the US, I think, called Kevin Hoffman, has got a very nice O'Reilly book that's free called Beyond the 12 Factors. And he talks about three other factors that are really good. When we're building kind of cloud native, which is a, another buzzword I appreciate, but when we're building these kind of services that are going to be deployed in the cloud and stuff and with containers, we need to bear things like the, the new architectural practices like 12 Factors in mind. And lastly, I see in my travels a lot, DevOps is another massively abused buzzword. Yeah, I see DevOps uh, meaning everything from um, a developer with root access to production, pretty much, yeah, which can be quite dangerous. I've been there. Um, but also through to massive change control, where people are kind of, you know, you've got to fill all these forms out before you can get stuff in. DevOps is almost like microservices and various things is becoming a little bit watered down. But the practice, the principles behind DevOps are really important to microservices particularly from a technical leadership point of view. So ask yourself, you know, are microservices you know, going to solve your problems? Are they going to help your business? This is a really critical question. And it's something I've struggled with. As my role when I was a CTO, as a technical leader, I really had to think hard about these questions. I had to take ownership of this because I've been there. When I started my career, I was always keen to learn the latest tech and the latest fads. But now I'm in a technical leadership role, I'm more responsible to the business. I have to look for the business value as well as the technical value. Where I was hinting at there is that one of the anti-patterns I see is the kind of micro silver bullets. Yeah, you know, we, we think a bunch of things uh, collectively in our industry are silver bullets sometimes. And I see this kind of, you know, there's no well-defined goals or strategies, but microservices must be the answer. Yeah. And this is, you know, 
No, we need to think about things like defining our business goals. We as technical leaders need to communicate that down through to our teams, these kind of things. And we need to choose hypotheses and create metrics and validate. And, cho you know, this, and choosing the tech is, is a big part of that. So what are our goals? Well, you know, let's wind it down a little bit. Clearly, as a business, we are delivering some form of value to our users. Yeah? And Adrian Cockroft talks a lot about this, but velocity is a key thing, or business agility is a key thing. Being able to react and outcompete uh, our competitors in terms of change is pretty much where it's at today. Net uh, Netflix and Adrian are really the poster children of that kind of stuff. Yeah? They did so well because they outcompeted Blockbuster, who, who by all accounts should have basically, you know, walked over Netflix with their kind of um, capital investment and their people involved, but Netflix just stormed ahead because they had business agility. For us, that's pretty much safer and more rapid, um, sorry, sa safer and more rapid changes to software systems. I think we can agree as, as you know, technical leaders and so forth, we will ourselves and help our team to do more rapid changes, but in a safe fashion. This is really key. And I'm going to, you know, a bit controversial maybe, but I'm going to say before you even look at things like microservices, think about continuous delivery. That for me is the first thing to look at. Can I get ideas quickly into production safely? I can do it with a monolith, Etsy do it. Stack Overflow is basically a C-sharp monolith, yeah, with a couple of really meaty databases on the back end. And I'm sure we go to Stack Overflow daily, pretty much as, as tech people, yeah. But a lot of um, pr problems can be solved really nicely with a monolith, but they've really invested in the CI and CD. Etsy and Stack Overflow are really awesome at this stuff. Think about you know, shared ownership, DevOps, and think about something called value stream mapping. I'm not going to go into that loads today, another slide in a minute, but think about... Um, the journey, basically, of idea to adding value in production, where really is your bottleneck? Is it in architecture? Yeah? Or is it maybe in design? Or is it maybe in getting things signed off? Look for where your bottlenecks are and target them. Once you have identified these things, things like situational awareness, knowing what the landscape is of both our technology internally and the industry we're working in in general is super critical. And Adrian Collier has done a fantastic um, uh, uh, slide deck here based on some of Simon Wardley's work about the, the pioneers and so forth, settlers and, and town planners. And Simon Wardley does a lot of what's called mapping, Wardley mapping. And Adrian basically has mapped out here what the microservice and container ecosystem will look like potentially over the next few years. Where are the signals in the market? Where are people investing in um, tooling? Where are people investing in architectural practices? And I'm not going to do it justice by going into it today, but if you're interested in understanding at a big picture from the, where the industry is going and where technology is going, Simon Wardley has got a really awesome blog and several awesome techniques that I use, Adrian uses, a bunch of interesting people use. Value streams are this. Phil Calzado, who used to work at SoundCloud, now at Linkerd and Buoyant, um, basically said the reason SoundCloud went to microservices is they created their value stream. They realized you know, the agility was being blocked by certain processes that microservices could definitely help with. And therefore, they went all in on microservices. You, we've got to understand where we are and then map it to where we want to go. The, where we want to go, and I'm not going to spend a long time on this, but we need to think about defining goals, you know, both from a business point of view and, and from a technical point of view. And there's plenty of documentation on this online. You kind of, you know, smart goals, and you pick your sort of pick your strategy. But the key thing I want to share is, is something I've worked on a, a lot of companies where microservice transitions or migrations haven't gone that well. It's because they've been driven by one side and not the other. And when I say one side, I mean they've either been driven purely by development, or they've been driven purely by management. Yeah? And there's been a massive disconnect in the middle, particularly around architecture and technical leadership. So what I've often worked um, with companies, and this is actually, I've obfuscated it a little bit for privacy reasons, but this is based on a genuine um, map I, I worked with people on, where we basically have got key stakeholders from the business, you know, C-level people, from some technical leaders, um, and also from people who are in the trenches coding as well. And we said, what's our overall business goals? You know, it was basically you know, uh, supporting entry into new global markets, um, supporting innovation, these kind of things. And then we mapped it down into an architectural level and we realized that by breaking certain things out, we could deploy them independently. So microservices would help us on this goal. And then the, the team were like, well, we want to do everything in Ruby. And then there was some debate, well, do we really want to invest just in one language to fit solve every problem? And some other people expressed interest in learning Java and JavaScript. And there were some people that were already experts in that. So then we said, well, we'll actually create a small, lightweight architectural council 
Now, when a service kind of comes up, we want to pull some functionality out of the monolith, we'll actually have a very small, controlled debate on what language we should use. And there's only going to be a, like, a couple, because we're not going to support loads of languages. But basically, the developers could look at what we sort of agreed as, as you know, design and delivery practices, and they could map it upstream to why they were doing what they were doing, and vice versa. Now, when we heard things like in the management suite, like you know, Docker and Kubernetes and microservices, they knew what that sort of meant. They knew it meant independent deployability. They knew it meant independent scalability. It helped with the communications. Yeah? It's kind of like if you're familiar with domain-driven design, there's a concept of a ubiquitous language, being able to speak the same language. And this is really critical. Speaking the same language and things like empathy, um, you know, I've heard that in the other track, the Herding Cats track, empathy, super, super important. Um, but communication is, is closely related to that. But you need to have a common framework to build that empathy, build that communication. I think the role of architect is, is changing. And I take a lot of my cues from Pat Kuar, who's actually at the conference, and also Simon Brown around this stuff. And when I play the role of an architect now, it's more, in my mind, technical leadership. And that's promoting shared understanding, coming back to the communication stuff again. It's about risk management. If I'm building Docker stuff, and do I want to bring Kubernetes in the stack? Maybe I do, maybe I don't, but it's all about risk management. And there's this very nice notion that Dan McKinley talks about called innovation tokens. And basically, you give yourself a number of tokens on you know, each year, and you spend them when you bring new things into the stack. So it stops you bringing in all amounts of crazy technology. So that's one way of sort of doing risk management. Just enough upfront design is something I've struggled with throughout my career, to be honest. I've over-engineered systems, and I've under-engineered under systems at times. With microservices, you need to do just enough upfront design, and that typically revolves around the boundaries, the interfaces, and the domains you're modeling, and the glue between them. That's if you're going to spend any time designing, you know, maybe you've got a greenfield project, or you're migrating a brownfield project, spend a bit of time doing things like context mapping. Really nice technique from domain-driven design, context mapping. You can also do things like event storming. There's a whole bunch of different techniques, but they help us as technologists understand the business domains better. This is really key for you know, the upfront design. Conway's law, buzzword bingo, check. You know, I've got to say Conway's law at a microservice talk, but it's well accepted. It almost, you know, it's almost become a bit cliched. What's not so clear is where architects sit in this role, in my experience. Some, I've had some projects where they've done the kind of, you know, squads, chapters, and all that kind of stuff, and then they still have enterprise architects up, up in the ivory tower. And I think, that really, for me, the best use of architects in this role is a, more of a consultative role. Many product teams, but consulting architects helping people. Another key thing I've seen in a couple of migrations is where a non-tech person is leading the team, and that's very popular in a lot of the squad models. You have like a product owner who is typically non-techy. Um, with a migration, the technical stuff often gets deferred because the product owner is um, incentivized based on business outcomes, which is great, but there's a constant friction. Business outcomes typically are short-term stuff, and architecture is more for the long term. So my recommendation is to have architects in a consultative role that kind of move around the teams and help these things, but pair product owners with technical leads, and they have the same weight. These things are really critical. So basically, if a product owner is saying, we need to get this business thing out tomorrow, the tech lead might have a chat and go, yeah, I agree, we'll get it out tomorrow, that, that's fine. But sometimes the tech need, lead needs to push back and say, no, if we don't invest now, two months down the line, you know, we're going to need to be do doing a massive rewrite. You, you need to balance the product ownership and the technical ownership, and it's really hard, I'm, I'm not going to lie. But Definitely pair tech leads with product owners in scrum-like teams, squad-like teams. Otherwise, it kind of leads to this anti-pattern, and it's a bit of technical insanity. I've been brought into some projects where it's got a bit messy with a monolith, and they try to do microservices, but six months later, it's exactly the same with many more things. Yeah? Because we're applying the same kind of patterns. The product owner is in charge. The product owner always wins. We don't invest in architecture. The microservices kind of get a bit crafty. We need strong technical leadership. Is, is the key takeaway. Not uh, easy to say, not so easy to do sometimes in organizations. Shifting gears a little bit, but 
I found this, um, this stuff really useful. So if you're bringing in microservices to an organization, often you're bringing in new technology to some degree, and you might be carving your code base now into many different repositories, many different things. And um, the concept of open source, I'm sure many of you, nearly all of us, I hope, are really into open source, um, things like you know, GitHub and Apache and that kind of stuff. There's a very interesting thing from PayPal, and PayPal took the ideas of open source and brought it into their enterprise. And they've called it inner source, yeah? Um, I think it's Diane, I've forgotten her surname, apologies, Diane, but she's a really awesome speaker. She's created some wicked um, PayPal resources, and there's a free O'Reilly book you can get now. And it talks about how to adopt some of the open source uh, ideas into your organization. And I found them really useful with working big enterprises who are suddenly, you know, carving up their monolith and bringing in new tech. Some of the things from inner source, and I'll call them out, uh, stuff that you, we probably take for granted because we're at a conference and we're into open source and stuff. But many enterprise developers, and I totally respect this, they nine to five job and they don't read perhaps external stuff, don't come to conferences or are not allowed to come to conferences. But sharing these kind of things, these kind of models really help. And it's stuff like, um, you know, you, you code basically in the open. You know, you code like in a repo and you allow other teams to look at your code. As silly as that sounds, I've worked in enterprises where one team was not allowed to look at the code of another team. You know, so break down the walls, um, share you know, the things that the principles, because open source is distributed by nature. You rely on open code. You rely on constantly running CI, CD, because you never know if a patch coming in is genuinely going to work. So bring all, all these things into the enterprise under the banner of inner source. I, there's some fantastic resources. I, I can't really do it justice in, in this time. This presentation is a little bit of a brain dump of stuff I found useful in my, my journey over the last five or so years. And in an enterprise, inner source can be really interesting to kind of drive a lot of change, drive a lot of collaboration uh, within an enterprise that might not be there. Another problem I, I bump into quite a bit is evaluating tooling. And I've been in quite, I've had to referee a few um, discussions over Docker versus Rocket, Go versus Java, Tabs versus Space, and that kind of stuff, yeah. Um, and for me, like, my, like Jessica mentioned this in her keynote yesterday, I, I, where I'm at in my career, I really don't care like, about Tabs and Spaces e easy anymore. I care about consistency, for sure. And the same with technology. I, I'm a Java developer, but I do Go as well, like, you know, whatever, pick the right tool for the job. But we often get stuck. This is a very interesting model I bumped into a couple of years ago at a conference. We often get stuck at dogmatic conversations. You know, I identify as a Java developer, therefore I can only do Java, you know, these kind of things. And this model, you can look at it more online, but it talks about if you recognize as a technical leader your team are getting stuck in the kind of tooling area, where we as humans are very good at tools, yeah, you need to walk up the spine until you can identify what the real problem is. So with the Java example, uh, it was at Java versus Go, and, I, and then we sort of walked up the stack and we looked at the practices and principles, and the organization actually really valued a very strong tool chain. Just the way the developers were really into like, heavy IDEs, um, you know, lots of processes, and that's what they valued. And we looked at the kind of current state of tooling in Java versus Go, and to be honest, the Java tool chain at this time we were looking at it was much stronger than the Go tool chain. Yeah. But I've worked on another project where they were looking to do um, very resource, um, light, a very lightweight resource driven, um, their business model based, was based on how much resource they were consuming in the cloud, and their Go was a perfect fit, because we could compile it down to really small binaries and run it, run you know, hundreds of Go processes on an on a EC2 instance. So, but you need to go up the spine and make sure what are we really optimizing for here? What, what, are our, what is our organization good at, bad at? And you know, often it goes right the way up to the needs. What do we as an organization need? We need strong tooling, therefore Java, as an example, these kind of things. It's a nice model I found to, it, it just jogs me when I'm having these conversations and I see we're getting stuck, I suddenly go, move up the spine, move up the spine. And that's, that's, that's our jobs as, as leaders, I think. Be aware, though, there is, it's very easy to fall into things like confirmation bias. You know, I realized, ah, we're, we're having a discussion around Java and Go here, and I like Java, so you know, I might be Googling, is Java still good in 2017? Well, that's a biased query, basically, yeah. You know, if I, this is a classic example, if, you know, is Docker bad in production, I get that article. If I search for, is Docker good, I get that article, yeah. Confirmation bias is, is everywhere. I've got a whole presentation on bias, actually. Um, and it is easy to be tricked, yeah. So if I was to give you a little bit of audience participation, if I was to give you three choices and say, um, which line is bigger, top line, bottom line, or they're both the same size, um, who thinks the top line is bigger? Quick show of hands. Got a few, cool. Who thinks the bottom line is bigger? No one, and who thinks they're both the same size? 
So the majority think are both the same size. I've actually tricked you in that this the top line is bigger, yeah? Um, because a lot of you have seen this before. It's a classic optical illusion, yeah? And again, we, we, are, we are clever people. We like, particularly technologists, we like to identify as clever people. I'm no, no different, yeah? But it's so easy to be tricked. You know, think about vendors are doing this stuff all the time. Like, it's, it's, you know, it is what it is. I've been a vendor. I am a vendor now, I guess. But um, be aware of these things. Be aware of your own bias. It, obviously, it's a bias, so you can't completely eliminate it. But just be aware of how you're searching for things, how you're evaluating things. This is really critical. And I don't say this lightly. I, I read a lot of books. I love reading. And I had a long commute to my old job. But I bumped into this book several years ago now. And it was one book that genuinely changed my life. Not just development, changed my life. Yeah. It, it talks through the, the way we as si uh, humans think. It talks about system one, system two. You, you may have bumped into those concepts. And like system uh, one is your kind of your fast, reactive brain, your reptilian brain. And, your, um, and the system two is your neocortex, the human bit. And they're constantly in conflict. And it's, it's just a fantastic read. And I suddenly understood myself a lot better. And I understood people I was working with a lot better. So this was a fantastic book. And it gets, gets some cheap laughs at conferences, which is great as well. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really, really good for comedy. But sort of wrapping these things up, the anti-pattern here is, is you know, not thinking about all these things I've just mentioned, and perhaps as an example, blindly copying tech from companies that appear successful without doing your due diligence, without thinking, what, you know, where are we in that kind of spine model? Um, you need to learn about the principles, practices, and cultures that have driven those tech decisions. Now, if you chat to Adrian, he'll freely share this stuff with you. In terms of Netflix, they were optimizing for a certain bunch of problems, you know, speed, autonomy, these things, and it led to the Netflix OSS toolchain. But if he was optimizing for something else, it may have been different to what popped out the end in terms of Netflix stuff. So and Netflix are very awesome. They've actually, this culture deck, if you haven't looked at it, check it out. You can get a flavor of what Netflix value. And when you understand what they value, you can see it often in their tools. Yeah? So just be aware. And, and Twitter opt optimizes very different things than Netflix, say. So if you bring on the Finagle stack, be aware you're bringing in a bit of Twitter into your organization, that kind of thing. So. Moving on into feedback. Uh, visibility and constant learning are super, super important. Anyone who's um, looked into sort of the DevOps stuff, you've got the three ways, a DevOps handbook and the Phoenix project talk a lot about these things. But in my mind, feedback is vital on many levels. But definitely, today we're going to discuss business architecture and operations. They're the things in my journeys with microservices I've sort of struggled with a bit. From a business level, sometimes just making things visible is genuinely revolutionary. I worked on some startups where we, this is called Dashing Framework, it's an open source framework. I, I created some real simple um, graphs with, with my team, and we put these on monitors on the wall, and, and the CEO like, just changed the business overnight. He could now, he was a lot more focused, he could understand you know, impacts of his decisions on revenue and all the, you know, in real time and all these things. Uh, and it, it just changed the connection between the CEO and the dev team. So simple little things, but making these things visible in real time can be really empowering for technical and non-technical people. And I think microservices, if you're going in that direction, you know, it's quite a big investment in, in terms of tech and architecture. You need to, you know, they, they should be business driven, and you need to bake in the tooling that allows this upfront. So metrics and signals baked into the services and baked into the platform, kind of from day one. Yeah, it allows validation of hypotheses. Are we getting to market quicker? Are we um, earning more revenue when we pushed out this new checkout? These kind of things. And, and, and uh, I saw a few of you, um, saw, I'm sure a few of you saw uh, Jonas Bonnier talk about uh, Lightbend, and this is like an awesome presentation by them. They talked about at Walmart how they saw a revolution in terms of business impact when they started doing things. They, all, they migrated to microservices, but they started monitoring a lot of things. They started adding metrics and being a much more data driven organization. Now, if you chat to anyone from Amazon and AWS, I always enjoy chatting, chatting to the AWS people, the two things that like, you'll, you'll walk away from any conversation with them is they are massively customer-focused. Everyone, like from, from, you know, from right from the way up, bottom to top, super, super customer-focused. And not only are they customer-focused, but they're metric-driven. Yeah? They care about the customer, but they care about measuring their impact. Yeah. This is from Jeff Bezos all the way down kind of thing. And, but it is super va valuable. You need to share these things throughout the organization. So if you're working in a corner on microservices and some other business units thinking, oh, they're wasting their time playing with Docker, the latest stuff, you need to share the hypotheses, share the metrics of success and these kind of things. Same thing from an architectural point of view. Um, so as you're doing a migration, it's really important to sort of keep the lights on or, or you know, keep the monolith or whatever ticking along. And you need to make sure that the architecture of the monolith is not degrading 
And also, the architecture of the microservices is not degrading as things move on as well. Excuse me one second. <clears throat> so it's really important to look for feedback in many different ways. Now, on the left is a fantastic book, Adam Tornhill. If you haven't seen him speak, please try and find his stuff. He's, he's, he does a TED speaker. He's done TED Talks. He's done, uh, I'm very lucky I've met him at many conferences. He's, he's talked of. Awesome book, Treat Your Code as a Crime Scene. Yeah, which I think says it all, doesn't it? But many of my codes have been crime scenes. So, but what you look at, it, what that uh, diagram at the top may look like is it may look like a city block, yeah, like New York or something. That's actually a code base. Yeah? And the blocks, the city blocks are modules or packages. The, the, the high-rise things, the width is the amount of code, and the height might be the complexity, the cyclomatic complexity. And the color is the churn from the Git logs. You can look in the Git logs and see how much people are committing to the code base. Yeah? So you can see there, tall buildings that are wide and dark blue are areas of a lot of code, high complexity, and high churn. Yeah, these are the areas that we spend all our days hacking in, basically. Yeah? So you, they might be candidates for microservices. You might want to pull it out, figure out what's going on there, or you might want to stay well away. Yeah? But the point being is you've got that feedback. You know what's going on in your code base. Things like Code Climate, Sonar Cube, uh, pick, you know, whatever language stack you're using, pick some of these, chuck them in your build pipeline. Get that feedback. Are we introducing more coupling as we're going along? These kind of things. It's really important to monitor this stuff all the way through. And lastly, look at your architecture overall. I uh, watched um, Chris's talk earlier on about uh, Lambda, and he was talking about using things like um, X-Ray, AWS X-Ray and Zipkin to understand your architecture. Please do, otherwise it does tend towards the Death Star. Yeah? And Netflix and, you know, and, and Guilt and Twitter can probably get away with it, but they have whole departments dedicated to running this stuff. Most of us are not that lucky. Yeah? So think about things like um, architectural complexity. You need to set up, the, the key takeaway from this slide is set up things to allow monitoring of architectural quality, of code quality, and of the architecture in general. The anti-pattern I see, even you know, particularly without feedback, but even with feedback, is that what I call the Trojan mono service. Yeah, it's all too easy for a monolith to creep back in somewhere. Yeah? And a big hat tip to Matthew Skelton, fellow Londoner. Um, he's got this fantastic presentation online, which I've linked to, and he talks about the four types of software monolith. There's the first one, the application monolith, we all know and love, or know and hate. Um, joined at the database, I've worked on many projects there where it was effectively a monolith, because if you change the database, it rippled through the entire application. But he also talks about monolithic releases. Yeah, that's, you know, you're, you're coupled, basically, if you have to deploy several services in one go, it's pretty much a distributed monolith. Yeah? And not only are you not getting the benefits because you know of going to microservices, because you have to deploy them all in one go, or many in one go, but you're paying what's called microservice tax. You're communicating over the wire, you're defining your net network boundaries. So, so watch out for those kind of things. And the last one, I didn't didn't get it until I saw it actually at a company, but there's monolithic thinking. There's taking all the mistakes we've made collectively with previous projects and applying it to the new ones. So the, the one I see quite a bit is people creating the perfect microservice framework. Yeah? They, they spend all their time, they've got Spring Boot, I do a lot of Spring Boot work, for example, so they, they've got Spring Boot and they layer on all these things because the previous projects failed because you know, there was some problem. And they kind of take their learnings and apply them and they spend a lot of time making this kind of perfect system, but it's very monolithic in its thinking. Although it sort of looks loosely coupled from microservices, it's monolithic thinking. And again, if I haven't been super clear there, check out Matthew's talk. He's a bit clearer than I am on this stuff. When I saw it, it was a really good talk. But the key thing is continually retrospect on technical work using supporting metrics. Yeah? Are we reducing coupling? Are we getting faster? Are we deploying quicker? These kind of things. Operational visibility, changing tack a little bit, but um, operational visibility is super important, allowing for operational feedback. If you're not into um, logging or monitoring, I think our jobs as developers these days, you kind of have to get a bit more familiar with that. You have to know how to log things effectively and monitor, and a lot of companies are moving to things like dev on call, where we as developers are responsible for uh, on-call support. And I, I actually like that. It's not super popular <laughs> at organizations I work at, but I like it a lot. But these are tips. Uh, I've, I found these articles really useful for understanding. I'll share the presentation uh, later. I think the guys have already got it, actually. But check out these, um, these things. But having this sort of feedback is when bad things happen, people are always involved. Yeah, I personally like to be this person when bad things are happening. Yeah? I personally like to be going, oh, yeah. Got it under control, put my beer down, yeah? No worries. Um, 
<laughs> jokes, all jokes aside, this is a fantastic, if you haven't seen this, it's actually in the Google SRE book now, the Site Reliability book. But I bumped into it a few years ago uh, where Mikey Dixon did a fantastic talk at one of the QCons. And he talked about, Mikey Dixon came in and saved um, healthcare.gov. People familiar with healthcare.gov in the US was crazy bad uh, when President Obama was president. Good times, yeah, back in the day. And um, when he was president, unfortunately, healthcare.gov didn't go quite to plan, so they brought in a bunch of experts from Google and from um, and Nori Haikinen went in. She did a fantastic work. Mikey came in from somewhere else, I can't remember. Um, and it basically, he formed, you know, they, they helped save healthcare.gov, and he formed this much like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you have like food and water, up all the way up to self-actualization. And he basically said, you know, you need monitoring in the bottom, you, you need the, the basic kind of probes into your system, but after that, it's all people. Yeah? How do we handle, when fire alarm's going off, how do we react? Particularly as leaders, how, do we, how we react influences our team massively, massively. So we need to think about things like, do, like Adrian said this morning, I really like Adrian's pitch of doing game days. A lot of companies doing this stuff now, like Google are the inspiration of these kind of things. Nori talks about this stuff a lot. But game days are really a good idea, just to you know, trigger stuff and see how people react. Because I know myself, you can plan in your mind how we're going to react, but when stuff really goes wrong, then you really get to find out. Google apparently, like Norway said this at a talk actually I saw, that Google do genuinely do real life chaos monkey. They, they go into a data center and start pulling out cables. And they check the right person gets paged, they check people follow through their drills, all these kind of things. If it becomes customer affecting, they put the cables back in really quickly. But in general, they, they really do like real life chaos monkey stuff. To check all these things, yeah, you know, it's, it's all about the people. Baseline monitoring, understand your system, but then how do you um, react to it? You need to do honest post-mortems yeah, on these kind of things, and then testing and, and so forth. I think I, one story, well, one funny story I would like to say, what share that Mikey told us is that he went into, um, into actually the healthcare.gov system. Like he went in on the first day, uh, and it, it was all like, you know, the system was on fire. It was like healthcare.gov was constantly crashing, coming back up. And he went into the team and he said to them, um, you know, we, I need to get a handle on this monitoring stuff. How do you know when the system is down? And then apparently the dev team like, looked up in the corner and pointed at this monitor in the corner of the room. Yeah, Mikey was like, awesome, probably got Nagios or some kind of graphs. And he walked over to the monitor and he realized it was CNN. It was a news channel. And when they reported it was down, they went and rebooted it. Yeah. It's, it's a bit hypocritical, that one, but as in, I, th I think it's a great story. Yeah? As in, you know, it, the, no the norm becomes the norm and it's bad stuff. You need to get proper monitoring in. Um, a little bit of standardization does go a long way. Now, automation is always the goal. Microservices are about numbers, about scale, but we need to figure the problems out. We need to have these um, responses and these post-mortems and all these kind of things. And these are my references for, for this. Um, I like checklists. When I'm looking to automate things, I like to build checklists to see what I'm going to automate. Susan's book is fantastic. It's, um, it's not so well known as perhaps, say, Sam's book, but it's a really nice book. It's more of a conceptual. Uh, she was actually working at Uber at the time this book was written, and it's a really nice um, model of how they did checklists, both from an architectural point of view, operational point of view. Um, and for me, and there's a great talk she did at the Microservices um, Summit, um, Providing some level of standardization, not going so far as we're doing kind of monolithic thinking, but some level of standardization helps us figure out, you know, to processes, uh, helps us figure out what to automate and how to automate. The, the takeaway for this bit of the section really is that microservices do enable agility when they're done well. Yeah? Um, we need to build, measure, learn, bake in signals both from a business point or from a business point of view, from an architectural point of view, and definitely from um, a operational point of view as well. Because if you don't collect the data, take action and change the way you're working, you're probably going to have the same thing built, but smaller. Yeah? The same problems you've got are going to be in microservices, but it, you need to build, measure, and learn. And these things are all about defining goals, metrics and recording you know, the data, excuse me, and taking action on the data. It's really key. So I've got about 10 minutes left. So yeah, final section is responsibilities. Now, the phrase, the American phrase, is the buck always stops somewhere. And I hear this a lot at the moment. As, as a consultant, I go in and, and I say, you know, people want help with their technology. And I say, great, I'd like to look at your business problem, though, and your team organization. Because it's, it's all, in my mind, it's all one thing as a consultant. Um, you can say it's just a technology problem. I don't trust you. So I'm, I want to see the whole thing. But they go, no, no, it's okay. We've got the people thing organized. We, we decided to reform our team around squads, chapters, and guilds. I'm sure people recognize that there, the, the phrase, yeah. It's Spotify, and I love Spotify dearly, but beware of what we call cargo culting. Yeah? And if you're not familiar with the reference, 
Google it. It's worth having a little read about this. But beware of blindly copying. Yeah? Repeat to yourself, you know, we are not Spotify. Yeah? We are not Google. If you look at the principles, practices, and values behind Spotify, and they are very generous, they have shared their values and principles um, by a couple of awesome videos, you will realize that Spotify are optimizing for uh, innovation, you know, if you can outcompete a fellow uh, music streamer, innovation's good. And they're optimizing for um, autonomy as well. If things fall over, it's a music streaming service, whatever. You know, as long as we're kind of we're loosely aligned and innovating, we probably win in the end. Now, if I'm building a nuclear reactor, or building software for a nuclear reactor, the last two words I want to hear are innovation and autonomy. Yeah? I want standards, I want people following processes. Yeah? So you've got to think, and I know it's a bit of a, a trivial quip I'm making here, but I, I genuinely see this in organizations where they've just picked Spotify stuff without any thought as to whether it fits to their organization. And as crazy as that sounds, it happens. It's really true. <laughs> DevOps kind of maps into this as well, and the Spotify thing, often Spotify don't talk much. They have started more now, actually, but they don't talk much about their platform team. And if you're building microservices, there is always a platform involved. And I like the idea of having a platform squad or a platform team, and I found Matthew Skelton's stuff. He talks about some uh, anti-patterns in the red and some uh, good patterns in blue of how to do DevOps. Yeah? And DevOps is primarily around, at least in this model, um, shared responsibility. And part of this is where does the platform begin and end? There's so many different models popping out. There is DevOps, there's SRE from Google, there's various different things. But if you're looking at the Spotify model and you're looking about how to um, support your microservice migration, think about the platform. You're probably going to be deploying onto a Kubernetes or an ECS or something. And then this notion of shared responsibility is vital. So um, was anyone affected by, sort of riffing on the same theme, but is anyone affected by the GitLab issues? Uh, it was like January time. GitLab basically is like a hosted you know, um, GitHub kind of thing, an enterprise one. They've got a public offering. It went down uh, in um, January, and they actually lost data. Not loads, but they lost a bit of data. Yeah? Um, and they were super honest. Their post-mortem, hat tip to them, it very graphically describes what went wrong and why they, you know, the mission-critical system, yeah? build systems, people are trusting them with their code. It's like... We say in the UK, it's like trusting someone with your crown jewels. It's like super important, yeah? Um, and one of the things they in their, in their um, post-mortem was a key thing here. Why, so basically, the system went down, and the backups also failed. The backups you know, failed to cut in. And it says there, why was the backup procedure not tested on a regular basis? Because there was no ownership. No one owned the backup. Everyone just assumed the backup would work, yeah? And that, for me, I've seen this many times before. What kind of knocks me a little bit, annoys me a little bit, is they've got the recovery procedures and the, and the remediation steps they're taking. And number 14, number 14 is assign an owner. That, for me, is number one. Unless I have someone owning this stuff, it's going to happen again, probably, isn't it? So think about it, as in giving people appropriate ownership within DevOps is key. Uh, too often, I, I do see DevOps as being a bit of a free-for-all. I joked at the start about you know, developer with root access. But DevOps is about shared responsibilities, but it's about responsibilities. They need to be you know, clearly shared, but people need to be accountable. Otherwise, it's a free-for-all. Yeah? And uh, you know, I'm, I'm poking fun a little bit at GitLab, but also the, you know, they're very generous for showing a post-mortem. I really do appreciate that. But these things, you know, it just shows if you, if you don't assign ownership, stuff slips through the cracks. When you're starting your kind of microservice journey or your DevOps journey, I often use things like RACI. Now, RACI is an old school project management technique, but it, and, and the RACI stands for responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. And you basically can go through your organization and dis, sort of discuss uh, who is responsible for the platform, who is responsible for the CI CD pipeline, who do I need to inform if I change these things, who do I consult if I want to change the build process. It's a slightly strict way of doing it, and it doesn't seem that DevOps, but it can be a nice way to get started. We, we're not looking to blame people, but we are looking to understand who is accountable, who is responsible for various things within. In this, within the system, yeah? And RACI can be a good start. It's something you hopefully grow out of and you, you know, move into bigger systems, but RACI can be an interesting way to understand DevOps and start increasing the shared responsibility. So in terms of you know, DevOps and defining responsibility, focus on what matters in terms of in DevOps. And I really do think that um, all the DevOps stuff for me starts with continuous integration and continuous delivery. Continuous delivery pipelines add so much value. And the kind of quip I like to use is, how much value does non-deployed code provide to users? How much value does non-deployed code? Zero, yeah? And that is a universal unit of value, yeah? If your code is just sitting there, it's not providing value to users. Be careful, you know, the, the need to kind of um, 
iterate and so forth, and it's sometimes tempting to want to create the perfect thing yeah, before getting feedback, before pushing it out there. And particularly if people um, are not responsible, they can often be in their own little silos building the perfect world. I've seen people try to create perfect kind of platforms, chassis, perfect documentation, um, and they're just building continually on undeployed and untested assumptions. And because they're not accountable or responsible, it, it just happens. I've seen, genuinely, I've seen projects go on six months, a year, where they've made really no progress because the individual silos are just building the platform, building a microservice chassis, documenting stuff, and there's no kind of you know, overall um, holistic ownership. The mindset change is key. So looking at things like continuous delivery, um, Dan North talks about the dancing skeleton. Basically, you, the dancing skeleton is getting the simplest thing possible all the way from dev to production. Dan's got some great talks on it. You can have a search on those. They're really good. But this notion of responsibilities and continually testing our assumptions is really valuable. So final couple of slides. So microservices, in my experience, do create a lot of change. And I think we as technologists can learn a lot from, from business people. And over the last few years, I've started reading things like HBR, Harvard Business Review. And for me as a techie, they're quite digestible. But there's some really nice um, papers they write and really nice articles they do that talk about how, we need to, how to manage change. Because fundamentally, if you're bringing in um, microservices, DevOps, Docker, Kubernetes, you're changing things. Yeah? And my experience early on in my career is I didn't know the impact of these changes, and I didn't know how to, how to lead them, how to manage them. And I've learned a lot from, from these kind of references. So I'd, I'd highly recommend checking it out. And my, my sort of final book recommendation is, is this by John Cotter. It's about leading change. I've seen a few microservice systems, kind of uh, microservice migrations, start up and then die off, and start up and die off. And the book is it's a more generic approach to, to leading change, but I can directly map it to a lot of projects I've worked on. You need to establish a you know, sense of urgency, create a kind of group of people that are going to be responsible for developing the, the strategy and pushing it forward. And then you empower people on the front line and you kind of iterate on successes, these kind of things. And I appreciate I am dumping a lot of books at you here, but wherever you are on your journey as an individual and within your company, try and pick one or something of them. And if you're on a, on a Microsoft migration, starting one, think about how much change your company is going through. And if the company is struggling, it might be worth reading some of these things just to understand, you know, businesses have been doing this stuff. Uh, there's a whole management consultancy practices doing exactly this stuff. So, wrapping up, strategies, the kind of, you know, the takeaways are ensure smart goals and accompanying strategies are defined and communicated. This kind of stuff is about big strategic goals, Empathy with your customers, empathy within the organization, but then communication. Why are we doing this? Start with why. It's really important. I think architecture is now more about technical leadership and, and risk management. So if you're a classic architect, you might want to rethink your role a little bit. Communication now is super important. Being hands-on is super important. You know, architects must code, in my mind, to develop that empathy. Choosing tooling is you know, it's really key, but again, if you're a leader, think about where you're coming from. Think about the spine model. Are you choosing tools based on the practices, based on the needs of the company, rather than what's cool? Yeah, and we all get sort of suckered into that sometimes. Feedback is vital. Feedback you know, from a business point of view, from an architecture, from an operations point of view. Optimize whatever you're doing in microservices for visibility and learning. Yeah? And it's throughout the organizational stack there. And responsibilities, you know, DevOps is a little bit misunderstood sometimes. I think we can learn a lot from Conway and Netflix and Spotify, but don't just blindly copy what they do. Look into the principles, practices, look into where your organization's at, these kind of things, um, and then take away what you will. Yeah, don't cargo cult, don't blindly copy. I think DevOps done right is a prerequisite for microservices. Uh, Martin Fowler actually has an article called Microservice Prerequisites. Um, and it's a great article. But for me, a lot of what he talks about is basically what we understand as DevOps. Yeah, platforms and continuous delivery and monitoring. Um, but you need, if you're a classic sort of enterprise and perhaps you're not so familiar with working in this way, need to understand things like who is responsible for these things, who is accountable, who is driving the change. That's the kind of core message. Uh, on that note, I think I'm like almost bang to time. I shall say thanks for your time. <laughs> How are we doing for time, guys? Pretty close, I'm guessing, is it? Yeah, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, there's no questions through the app at the moment, so... It is like at late in the afternoon. I'm it thinking, is the you know? last <laughs> session nearly before the keynote. So <laughs> does anybody have any questions here? Hang on. So let me get the microphone for you. 
Um, very good talk, thanks. Um, I, I was just wondering if you have some thoughts on, because as you say, the complexity in a microservice system is much in like the cooperation or communication between the, the services. Do you have any tips on where do you store, say, the, the configuration that you need for the services to communicate uh, between each other? I mean, like URLs and database stuff and container names and stuff like that. Do you have any like tips? Yeah, good question. So um, what I would, a couple of, sort of technologies to look at, a lot of the things like service discovery and config management go kind of hand in hand, as you, as you alluded to. So in the past, I've used things like console quite a lot. HashiCorp console uh, is very good. Um, there's, there's a bunch of other ones as well that do very similar. Zookeeper do similar things. But I find things like, uh, I love the HashiCorp stack, to be honest. And HashiCorp, um, it's a single you know, binary, a lot of their stuff, and compared to Zookeeper, is a bit more tricky to read. Um, so I, uh, console is really awesome, I find. It's, a kind of, it's one thing to look at. There's many others around that. And for secrets, uh, HashiCorp have got a vault. So vault is, um, is really good in terms of like, providing certain cryptographic guarantees around storing data. Um, many of the platforms now, like Kubernetes, are popping up with things. They've got a notion of config maps. So config maps in, in uh, Kubernetes allows you to map, say, a file or a file system into the pods directly. And you can put uh, data files in those um, config maps. So, and I think ECS has got similar stuff. ECS, you can do it through user data and bootstraps. So a lot of the platforms are realizing it's an issue. Uh, console, I've got a head start on them, but there's a lot of platform-specific stuff. What a shameless plug here, what I would say is um, have a look at something called service meshes as well. Particularly for the communication point of view, there's a thing called Istio. It is proper hipster, I'll, I will say that now. I did a talk on it um, earlier in the week, actually. I did a, uh, last, I'm did i getting confused in my days. Last week, I did a talk at Cloud Natives. Um, so you can have a look. If you go to the Skills Matter website and, and search for service meshes, um, you can see me talking about um, how the platforms are evolving. So maybe not something you want to pick up today, maybe console's better, but if you want to have an idea of where um, sort of HTTP-like communication might be going and how service discovery and all these things are done, service meshes are basically where all the big companies are at now. Google, your Ubers, your AWS, and people have started talking about it. So I, I at least want to look what they're doing to see some inspiration. Anybody else? Any questions now? Well. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys.